Welcome, guys. We've got another really exciting uh, lab for you guys today. This one is an introductory uh, topic, so we're going to be kind of tiptoeing through machine learning. Uh, it's a, it's going to be a good one, regardless of where you're at on the skill level. So beginner, intermediate, advanced, doesn't matter. Um, you should all pick up something in this talk today. Uh, we are going to be focusing on a new machine learning package that's just hit the streets recently and that's called parsnip so this is going to be a really cool one um, we'll do some live coding but we'll also um, kind of balance it out with uh, some some slide decks as well just to explain a little bit um, about machine learning so yeah with that said let's get started um, structure for the learning lab today it's going to be about 15 minutes of presentation at the beginning then about 30 minutes of coding, and then about another 15 minutes of presentation at the end. And then uh, we will stay on, so that'll balance out to about an hour. And then uh, for those that can hang on, uh, we'll, we'll be available for some Q&A at the end. Okay. Um, David, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm David Curry. I'm the founder of Sure Optimize, and we uh, specialize in marketing analytics and search engine optimization. And we're all about transforming people's marketing into a modern platform. Right, and I'm Matt Dancho. I'm the founder of Business Science, and I'm a data science instructor at Business Science University. Yep. Okay, so uh, the agenda for today, we've kind of, we've got a jam-packed schedule. Uh, first, what we're gonna be doing is focusing on why you should be learning machine learning. And we're gonna talk about key benefits, so those are, <laughs> high impact problems that we're going to be talking about and that that should hopefully help sink in where you can um, dedicate your resources to learning and uh, which problems you can potentially solve with machine learning. Uh, then we're going to go into like a live example of applying machine learning to a business problem. So we're going to be developing a pricing model based on some data that I've web scraped off of the internet uh, from one of my favorite bicycle manufacturers, Cannondale, and um, we're going to be using the Parsnet package, which is a API for machine learning. It's kind of like Scikit-learn, if you've, if you've ever heard of that on the Python end. Uh, Parsnip's very similar to that for, for R. Um, we are gonna be focusing in on several different programs, or several different algorithms. Uh, one of them is XGBoost, we're gonna use that today. Um, and then we're gonna wrap it up with some learning recommendations, uh, focusing in on which algorithms you should be learning and then how you can apply advanced machine learning to business. Okay. So why learn machine learning? Well, for number one, it's the most in-demand skill of this century, and that is a fact. Why is it so in-demand? Well, companies are drooling over this skill set because of what you can do with it. You can predict, which is something that companies are currently struggling doing. And you can also uh, explain those predictions. So once you develop a model that approximates a business problem, you can actually determine what features or what aspects or factors of that problem are contributing to the, the, uh, the prediction. So you can be, then begin to explain why the business outcomes are happening. So that's very important. Uh, and what you really can do with it is you can solve some very high impact problems. So when I say high impact problems, I'm talking about problems with a lot of zeros behind them. So uh, for example, uh, over here we have in the sales category, problems that you can solve customer churn. If you end up solving or uh, improving customer churn by reducing the churn rate, that can save your company 15 million, 20 million, 100 million. So this can be very valuable for that particular company. Uh, demand forecasting, if you can improve the forecasting of products and, and sales each month, that can uh, save the company a lot of money because of all of, the, um, all of the things in that business that are driven off of the, the demand forecast. Uh, switching over to finance, fraud detection. Fraud, fraud for banks is huge, that's a, a billion dollar problem. So being able to uh, detect fraud as anomalies, that's something that's very valuable. Same thing with predicting whether or not a, a customer of theirs is going to default on their debt. Uh, if you can predict that, that's a, that's a huge problem. HR, employee attrition, 
marketing, uh, understanding anything about the customers, and then accounting, uh, being able to predict and forecast cash flows uh, or detect payment anomalies. You know, these are things that can all help that business. So one of the key things that I want to talk about, and this is kind of a precursor to the next slide, is that a lot of these huge problems are what we call binary classification. And that is predicting whether or not, say, a customer will leave, yes or no. That's a binary outcome. And these are uh, the biggest problems tend to be binary classification. Um, what I will say is that's kind of where you need to go, but it's uh, binary classification is also the most difficult to learn because there's a whole series of performance aspects that are just a little bit difficult to understand and it's easier to actually under, understand regression. So we are gonna be starting off today with a regression problem, but I view that as kind of a precursor to binary classification. Once you learn regression, then it's kind of like a stepping stone. Okay, so um, we talked a little bit about binary classification and uh, regression. These are, you know, in machine learning, there's a lot of technical jargon. So for those that are just now um, hearing about machine learning, um, some of the, the key terminology, there's two different types. There's supervised and unsupervised. We're gonna be focusing on a supervised problem, which is where we already have a da data compiled of the outcome. Which, it, which for us is going to be a price, and we have some features that are related to that outcome. So these are uh, bike models, um, the weight of the bike, uh, and, and just different features that are related to that bicycle. Um, when we talk about supervisors, two different types of supervised learning, and we've already talked about those two. One is regression, which is a, 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 simpler, a simpler form, and what you're trying to do is predict a numeric value, and then you've got classification, which is where you're trying to predict uh, whether or not yes or no, true or false, um, which is, is, tends to be a binary classification problem. Um, on the unsupervised end, you do have this uh, topic called clustering, which is another major um, branch of uh, machine learning. And uh, we use that a lot for um, solving problems like customer segmentation. It's an unsupervised problem because we really don't know how many groups exist. We have to, to leverage the algorithm to tell us um, how many groups exist. Uh, and, and we do that through like analyzing purchase history and, and those sorts of things. So again, a lot of technical jargon machine learning, but really the main thing to understand is that we're going to be doing a problem where we already have prices, the outcome is, is already given to us, and we have features related to that outcome, and we're gonna try and predict new prices based uh, by building a model off of that. Uh, and again, this is a stepping stone towards classification. Okay, so um, we're gonna be doing a regression example. Uh, do we have any questions at this point, David? Um, yeah, sorry, actually I had a, a short power outage, so I disappeared for a second. Um, but yeah, Andrew says, what is unsupervised about it? Um, I guess he's just talking about the unsupervised. The yeah. So, so, and I don't know exactly why they came up with the terminology supervised and unsupervised, but basically, uh, what the difference is, is that in clustering, the way I visualize this is that we've got a data set of all sorts of say different customers that have, that have purchased different products but um, we don't know what group they belong to, meaning that there's no label there for us. Like uh, customer you know, one uh, belongs to, to group number five, customer two belongs to group number one, customer three belongs to group number four, and so on. We don't already have that, we have to determine that, and that's what the algorithm allows us to do. Um, on the supervised end, this is where we already have um, prices given to us, which is our outcome, and we need to figure out, um, or we need to build a model using data that's related to that outcome. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, I okay. think they're. I think they got it. And then um, Kunal asked, "Is there any difference between regression and statistics and machine learning?" So regression is a form of machine learning. So we can see it's down here. So these are all forms of machine learning. Um, statistics is uh, 
basically built on like your linear regression, but machine learning um, takes it a step further in my mind, uh, where we're using all sorts of different algorithms like uh, XGBoost. Um, we talked a lot about H2O last week. H2O is, is a machine learning um, high performance algorithm that does a lot for you. So the, the way I would view it is statistics is more like um, just kind of your basic inference and that sort of thing. And then machine learning kind of takes it to a whole nother level with these advanced algorithms. Yep. All right. Okay. All right, cool. Well, I'm going to take a drink real quick. Did we get to the, sorry, I, I hate to, to jump in because I was missing for a chunk there. Um, but did we get to the parsnip yet? Not yet. So that's going to be in this okay. section. Okay. okay, sorry. Yes. All right. So now that we know a little bit about machine learning, uh, what I want to do is uh, talk about a specific example, which is what we're going to be working on today. So um, the presentation materials for this presentation, uh, and just don't, don't uh, try and search for them right now. What I would recommend is uh, afterwards, after this is over, um, go get the presentation materials. We're, this whole thing's recorded, uh, this whole learning lab. So um, I do want to point you to where the materials are going to be. But um, for the purposes of this presentation, you should probably just follow along. Um, but the presentation materials are all going to be stored right here in our presentations library on GitHub. And it'll be in this, um, whoops, the, the thing covered it up. But basically, it's going to be in this one down here. Um, it's, it's the uh, Learning Lab 05. Okay. All right, so the data that we're gonna be working with is um, some data that I'm very familiar with, but that's just because I like to uh, ride bicycles. Um, it's gonna be data that I web scraped from a manufacturer called Cannondale. And what they make is high performance bicycles. And you can see here that on their website, they have a product, they have uh, a product name, a price, and then they have some additional details such as like weight, uh, and frame material and, and so on. So what we're going to be trying to do in this presentation is to build a model that um, predicts what the prices should be based on some of these features that are built into this model description and then some of these additional details. So that's going to be the first goal. And then the second goal um, that we're going to try and understand at a global level is to understand what features are driving the model. So this would be like, um, so we've made a prediction. Now, why is that prediction what it is? Okay. The package that we're going to be using is the Parsnip library. So this is a brand new library and it's really nice. I like it a lot uh, because it interfaces with the tidyverse, which is something that I use in, in our programming. So using packages like dplyr, ggplot2, it just fits right in with that family. Um, there are some key links here. So uh, these two links that will be in the presentation material, so don't worry about copying them down now. Um, you guys are all gonna get copies of this, but um, it's gonna be the location of this website. And then once you go to that website, uh, it has this tab called model list, and that's the second link here. And what that does is it shows you all of the models that it connects to. So this parsnip, package, think of it like a layer on top, and it has all of these algorithms that it connects to underneath it through these functions. So you've got a function here, it connects to uh, three different libraries. This function here connects to another three different libraries and so on. Okay. Oh, before we move on, okay. so that's, I wanted to be sure to jump in on this slide. Um, if we could talk a little bit about uh, the difference between Parsnip and H2O, because, you know, we've, We've, we're big proponents of, of H2O, uh, but um, some people might be wondering, like, what's the difference? You know, we've covered H2O in the past. Now we've got this new library going on. Right. So, so good, great question, David. So H2O is your high-performance machine learning package that does a lot of the stuff um, that you need to be able to do, uh, such as cross-validation, grid search, hyperparameter tuning, and all of these different terms that we'll talk about once we get into the code, uh, it does a lot of that for you. It also does automated machine learning, so it'll test um, 
for example, uh, it, it tests all of these different algorithms at once uh, on your uh, model, and then it comes up with the best approaches, and then it actually does this thing called stacking, which is where it combines several of the algorithms to uh, produce what's called a super learner. So that's what H2O does. It's high performance, it scales really well to large data sets, and um, it's, it's personally what I use uh, all the time when I'm doing um, you know, projects for companies. Uh, the Parsnip package though still um, fills a nice spot in my mind because what I love about Parsnip is that it interfaces really well with the tidyverse and it's really good for learning and um, applying and actually like figuring out how these algorithms work. So that's why in the 101 course we teach Parsnip and then in the 201, which is the advanced machine learning course, we teach H2O. Yeah. And just one related question before we move on. Um, can you uh, conduct cross-validation and hyperparameters tuning uh, within Parsnip as well? Um, it's not in Parsnip right now. I know that they're building it out, but they don't currently have that, um, that functionality. They have a package called rsample, but I, um, it, when I was going through this lab, kind of behind the scenes, uh, you're gonna see the parameters that I, I choose. Those were all cross-validated, but I had to build special functions uh, and it got a little bit uh, complex. Uh, fortunately, I do know that uh, Max Kuhn and his group at our studio is working actively to make that process a lot easier. It's just right now it's still a pretty new package. So um, the, the algorithms, are all in there. It's just some of the additional functionality like cross-validation um, still has a little bit to go. Okay, so there's a few more questions, but we'll, we'll um, get those in before the end of uh, the presentation. Okay, all right, cool. So it's demo time. I'm gonna switch over, and again, you guys are all gonna get access to um, this, this uh, script file that I have up here. Um, there's a few files that I want to point you to when we get started. Um, so what we're working in right now is um, this file here. It's the intro to machine learning.r. And I believe that is, yes, I need to move that into the right folder, which is this one here. Okay, it's going to close it out. Okay, so what I'm what what file we're going to be working with is this intro to machine learning.r. It's going to be in this learning labs 05 folder in, in the presentations library on GitHub. So when you download that presentations folder, you're going to get all of the presentation material, and then you're going to get this um, for this lab, you're going to have this file here. So I'm going to click on that, open it up. Um, it's going to just get kicked off with some libraries that we're gonna load. And really, these are gonna be the libraries that we're gonna use um, for most of our, our problems, which is like Tidyverse. Uh, I use TidyQuant a lot, but um, primarily I'm gonna be using it this um, for, for this presentation for the, the uh, ggplot themes, which are for visualization. Uh, we're, we're gonna be really focusing in on this package here. Um, and then the, the rest of these packages are kind of helper packages. So they have a few functions in them that we're gonna be using. But really the big one here is this, is this parsnip package. And then the parsnip package is going to connect to a few different um, other packages that I'm gonna load behind the scenes. Uh, R part, which is for decision trees, R part dot plot, which is for plotting decision trees, and then XGBoost, which is for the XGBoost library. So I'm just gonna run these here. And that's going to load all the libraries. Um, I also have a few scripts that I'm going to pull in for some functions that I built um, just to kind of abstract away some of the technical details so we can just focus in on, on learning about the data. So when I source these three files, these are in our scripts file, it's going to source these functions that are in these, in this, um, these different R, .R files. So I'm going to run this one, this one, and this one. And then in my environment, I'm, I now have these three functions here. And we'll use those uh, later on in, in the um, tutorial. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to load in our data. So this is the data that I web scraped here. It's called this price versus weight tibble. And that comes from this data folder. 
So I'm pointing to this price versus weight.csv file. So when I pull that in, and all that data looks like is it's got a row ID, it's got the price, uh, the numeric value of the price, the category it came from, the product family, the model name, and the weight. And this is all data that I just web scraped off of Cannondale's website. Um, the next thing that I did, which I did this behind the scenes so we don't um, focus too much on, on the code, uh, is I actually built some engineered features. So what I did was in this model description, so a lot of times in business data you're dealing with these kind of like generic description fields and you can actually create a bunch of different features out of those. So what I did was I actually built or I, I um, kind of broke this, this model feature down into a bunch of flags. So what it looks like when I load that data in is instead of the, um, the model name now, what it does is it splits it up into what's called a model base, which is just the first part of the model name. And then there's a bunch of different uh, flags that I made based on what it's seeing over here. So for example, high mod is a flag, uh, optimo, red, and these are just terms that appear frequently in that model description. So these are what we call engineered features. And um, if you wanna learn how to do feature engineering, uh, I definitely recommend taking the 101 course because in week three we do feature engineering. Okay, so at this point, what I think I wanna do is I wanna give you guys a glimpse of what the data looks like. So I, I've um, pre-built this function called plot price versus weight. And what this does is it just um, plots the weight and the price for each of the bike models. And uh, it separates them out by category. So there's a mountain and a road. And um, what we can see here is this gives us kind of an idea of how these models work. So when I hover over these points, um, we've got all sorts of different bikes in this data set. And you can see that each one has a model name category of uh, it, the, for this particular model is road product family it belongs to is kind of like a, a secondary category, which is endurance road. Uh, it's got a price of $8,400 and a weight of 16.8 pounds. And what we can see that's very interesting is that these are high performance bikes. So as the weight goes down, meaning as you go from a, a 20 pound bike to a 16 pound bike, the price tends to go up uh, and that's for road bikes and then for mountain bikes. So if I do, if I click on these, these are the mountain bikes here. Um, we can see the same type of trajectory, although mountain bikes tend to be a little bit heavier because they have suspension and they have other different aspects of them that makes them a little bit more durable than a road bike. Um, but you can see kind of that same type of, um, of, uh, of, of kind of increase in value or price with the decrease in weight. So why is that? Well, it's because a lot of people who are using these want to have a lower weight bike so they can go farther with them. Uh, it makes them faster and it makes them able to go more miles. So uh, it ends up being um, a high performance thing to have a lighter bike. Yeah. Okay. So what, um, is there anything else you think I need to, to cover, David, on the, on the day? I think there's, I think there's uh, just two quick notes in general I wanted to mention. As we step through the code, um, the code is very well documented, so you can see, you know, the steps we're taking. But I think it's important to remember that this is, this is sort of your data workflow. Um, there's, you know, if you can bring up the table of contents, Matt. Yep. Yeah, so if you click this yeah. button over here, this it all has a table of contents. So right now we've we've loaded the libraries and the data setup is is what we're in right now. This section two here. Yeah, and so when you put in those four dashes in your your comment, it'll in our studio will make a, a table of contents section. But um, yeah, when you guys get the code, you'll be able to step through it and you can see which you know section you're in. Also. Um, we're focusing on the machine learning aspect, but um, you know, in real, like in a real work environment, you'd probably be doing a lot more data analysis and trying to understand the data and everything. Um, we chose this particular visualization because it, it perfectly describes the data and we, we've already understood it. Um, but that you'd probably have a lot more involved in the, um, the data analysis part. 
which you won't get here because it's not the focus. So I just wanted to mention that um, for yep. people. Yeah, and, and the key here too is once we get down through, um, we're, we're gonna be spending a lot of time on this machine learning um, section. So uh, the, the, the key here is that we want to showcase and we want to highlight the parsnip package. So we're, we're gonna be kind of jumping through and, and more quickly going through some of the other steps, which is like the, which is also very important, like exploratory data analysis. Um, this is one example of exploratory data analysis where you can pull up uh, and start to, to visualize the data um, in terms of some of these key features that you're finding. Okay. All right, um, this next section here, so we've just plotted the price versus weight. I'm just gonna run this line of code here, and all this does is it takes our price versus weight and it joins it with the engineered features, and then it drops some of these, um, these features that are, um, that, that are infrequent. So they don't have, uh, very, they don't, they're all, there's only one or two bikes in the data set that have a product family of trail, and a product family of TT and try. So when I do this section here, we now have a, um, a combined data set that's called pricing model tibble, and it has the core features here, and then it also has the engineered features on it. So we've got a lot of different features. We can see that it's 21 different columns now. Um, and the, the bulk of those columns were based on this model column here, which it's getting um, shorten, but there's um, a bunch of features that we were able to build out of it. Okay. Um, all right. So the next section here, and I'm not going to belabor this one, is uh, just splitting the data set up into a training and test set. Uh, the key point here is that we don't want to, we want to train our model on, um, on a training set, which is about 80% of the full data set, and we want to test it on about 20%. Uh, which is uh, the, the other 20%. So this is uh, this prop here. What I'm doing is I'm splitting up the data uh, by a proportion of 0.8, which will go into the training set, and about 20% will go into the test data set. Um, because this is a random sampling, I, I use the set seed, and then when I run this code here, it's gonna split it up into a training and test set. So now if I have, if I look at my training set, uh, it's 50 uh, rows, and the the uh, and it started at 62, so the test set should be 12 rows now, and it is. Okay, so when we do machine learning, we're going to be training on this training set, and then we're going to be evaluating how that model performs on the testing set. So you never want to um, you never want to evaluate your models on data that's been trained on because the model will give you false sense that you're doing really well, when in reality it may not, um, it, it may not predict, on, predict well on new data. So that's why we're doing that. Okay, all right, so now we're getting into the core part of what I wanted to show you guys today, which is how to do machine learning with the parsnip, with the parsnip package. So uh, the key piece is we're gonna go through um, three different algorithms and we're gonna create four different models so one of the algorithms we're gonna do two different models with, and um, it's gonna be a good way to showcase uh, both the benefit of feature engineering and also from trying out different models and seeing how they uh, approach the problem differently. Um, things that we're, we are, what I do wanna cover and make sure that you guys understand is, in 30 minutes, we're not gonna be able to go, to go through every detail about these algorithms. So what I want you to know is, we do have about five hours of video just on algorithms in our 101 course in week six, machine learning, and then um, cross-validation and grid search. So uh, once we get to like XGBoost and, and there's parameters, and I'll, and I'll uh, show you what that means later, uh, you need to do cross-validation on those, and that's something that we cover in the 201 course. Okay, um, so to get started, what I actually want to focus you guys in on is just the flow of this piece, these four lines of code here. So there's three key functions. There's three key steps. First, we're, we're creating a function using parsnip using this function called linear rig. And then what we're doing next is we're setting an engine. 
So we're actually picking which algorithm uh, for this particular um, setup that we want to use. And then we're supplying it to a third piece, which is fit. So that I, this is all brand new to you, but really what I want to get across here is if you learn how to do these three steps, then you know Parsnip. So um, let's step down through it. The first function here is linear reg. So I'm just gonna pull up the documentation. So when I run this line of code here, uh, line 76, with the question mark in front of it, it pulls up the documentation over here. And uh, this is how that, that function is set up. But when I wanna scroll down, so this is gonna do linear regression models for us. Uh, but what I wanna do is I wanna scroll down here and showcase in the details section, uh, they have it documented which engines are available. So I could do uh, LM, which is our, our, for our basic linear model, GLM net, which is for doing regularized regression, uh, which is an advanced technique that we cover in, in the 101 course. Uh, you can do STAN, you can actually connect it to Apache Spark, and even Keras. Um, but we're gonna focus on this one. So my point is, is that the linear regression is the first function, and we're gonna, we're going to um, set that up first, but it also tells you, whoops, it also tells you which engines are available here in the details section. So really, if you know which function you want, then you also know what options are available for your engines. Um, and that's really, the, the, these are the, the kind of the two most difficult pieces is just figuring out what you want to do. Um, so this first linear regression, uh, the arguments that it takes is this mode. So I'm gonna set that to regression. And then it has two additional arguments, uh, which are for regularized regression. And you can see that here. Um, and It'll actually tell you in the details that these arguments are only available for specific models. So for the, the um, uh, regression for GlemNet and Spark and Keras, the penalty is available, uh, but we aren't using any of those. We're, we're going to be using this LM. So when you run this line of code here, what it does is it sets a linear regression model spe specification. So that's what Parsnip is doing, is it's basically saying, you're, you're basically telling it you want it to set up a linear regression. And then you pipe it into this piece when you do the set engine, and that tells it, okay, you're gonna do a linear regression, and you're gonna use the LM module, uh, which is for the um, basic linear regression that, uh, that comes in the stats package. And then once you do that, you're ready to then begin uh, learning. So how you do that is you set up using this fit function. So you just pipe your model specification into this fit function and it produces a model object for us. So fit looks a little um, interesting here. What we're doing here is just a basic linear regression with no engineered features. And um, what we're, so what I'm going to be doing is if I look at that train tibble, I'm just gonna be using um, price underscore num, which is our price. And I'm going to, so that's gonna be the thing that we want to predict, which is our outcome. And it's gonna be as a function of the category, product, family, and weight, uh, which is right here. So these are, it's not including any of these model, these engineered features, and it's also not including the model uh, because that's a description field and it's not gonna, we aren't gonna be able to predict off of a description field. And that's really why we built these engineered features. So the reason I'm doing this first is to give us a baseline for with and without engineered features. So when I run this and I save it as this model 01LM, what that does is it creates a parsnip model object. So you can see that right here. I, I sent this to the screen, this model 01LM, and that's a parsnip model object that contains this, um, this, this modeling algorithm. And what you can see here is it actually has some of the, the, the summary information from that particular model. So the next step is once you build a model, um, you want to predict with it. So that's what the predict function is. And when I run this line here, and I, and I run it on with new data set to the, our test table. So remember, I split it up into a training and test set, and I've trained just on, 
and I, I trained just on the training set and then now I'm testing or I'm predicting on the test set. It outputs a 12 by one tibble of predictions. So these are dot pred, which is what it names for predictions. And we can see that these are the prices that it's predicting for each of the, mo the models that are in our test data set. So again, our test data set, it's 12 rows, so 12 different bikes. And this is, this is the actual value. And we've just predicted the, new, the, the price that the algorithm is, is selecting. So really, once you learn how to do these steps, machine learning with Parsnip, you, you, you pretty much understand it. The, the next, you know, the only thing that you need to learn is really which algorithms you want to learn and use and which parameters um, you can adjust. And I'm going to show you that coming up soon. Okay, so we've already made our first prediction. Now um, what I'm gonna do is I've actually created some helper functions. So now what I wanna do is I wanna actually like understand how well those, those predictions did. So this first one is, is uh, what's called plot predictions. And this is um, a helper function that I pulled in when, I, when we sourced that code at the beginning. So the plot predictions is what I'm running. And what it does is it gives me a little plot that looks like this that shows the, um, this is the actual value and then the prediction. So we can see for observation 12, uh, it didn't do so well. So the actual value was $2,300 and our algorithm predicted $5,200. So off by you know about $3,000. Uh, this one, the Scalpel SI High Mod World Cup Edition, uh, it predicted $6,800 and the actual price was $10,500. So uh, basically you can see that some, some of them, they did do well. Um, this one, it, it looks a little bit better. This one, it's pretty far off. So the model is doing, is, is predicting um, sort of well, but I think we can do even better. Um, and then the last piece here is another helper function that I, that I built called calc metrics. And again, this is one of the, the functions that I sourced that you guys will have access to. And that's this calc metrics function here. It's just a helper function to, to allow me to calculate some, some metrics. Um, and the metric that we're gonna go off of is what's called mean absolute error. What, this, what mean absolute error does is it takes and adds up all of the absolute values of error. So error is about $3,000 for this one. Um, it's about, we'll say 4,000 for this one and so on. It adds up all of the errors, the absolute value of that, and then it takes the mean. And on average, this model is off $1,553. So that is kind of our baseline. We want to try and do better than $1,553. All right. So we talked um, about quite a bit of information there, but really it's three different steps to using Parsnip and then one additional step to do a prediction. And then we did, just did some visualization and calculated some metrics with some code that I'll give you guys. Okay, do we, uh, do we have any questions at this point, David? Um, yeah, there's just some that I've answered already, but a few I've kept because I think it may be beneficial to everyone. Um, uh, <laughs> One is uh, feeding category product family that are in string to regression. Uh, does it internally convert it to numeric values? Yes, yeah, it does. So under the hood, yeah. all of the algorithms, uh, for the most part, I believe, all convert uh, character values to factors and then factor values to, uh, to dummy them. So if you're not experienced with machine learning, that's a lo lot of jargon there. Yeah, but, but basically what it's convert doing is converting it to zeros and ones and it'll um, convert it into a column of um, basically binary. So for a yeah. category that has say three, three different, you know, say it's a, a, a road and a mountain bike, it'll convert that into different columns. So mm -hmm. category road, zeros and ones, category mountain, zeros and ones. Yep. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of some of the jargon or more advanced sort of statistical analysis stuff, we're uh, kind of 
glossing over that part so we don't confuse people because for some people this is all new yeah um, yeah so just you know just know that that's you know that stuff has has been considered already well th this stuff I'll, I'll tell you what parsnip was brand new to me um a month ago so uh this is probably brand new to to most everyone on the call but it's oh. I, I found it really useful and really easy once I got the hang of it. Um, all right, so the next model that we're gonna build is now uh, with engineered features. So really the only difference between the, this model and the first model is that instead of doing this price numeric as a function of category, product, family, and weight, what we're doing now is price numeric as a function of dot, which means everything. So we're, we're now expanding to all of those engineered features. So if I do the train tibble again, we're now expanding to model base um, and all of these engineered features that I created. So when we do that, what I wanna do is I wanna show you um, what happens when we include some good features. I'm just gonna run this, it's, uh, again, it's nothing new, uh, linear regression, set engine LM, and then fit price as a function of dot, which is everything instead of um, listing out each one of the features independently. So when I do that and just run the section of code, we can make some predictions the same way we did last time with the predict function. And now these are the new predictions. And then um, what gets really interesting is when we start to plot those predictions. So you see how we have these big gaps here? When I run this new one, now the gaps shrunk a lot. So now this one, this model is doing a much, much better job of predicting on unseen data. So what that tells us is that those engineered features are very valuable to this particular model. Uh, we haven't changed the algorithm at all. We haven't even used like XGBoost or a deep learning model or anything fancy. We're just using a linear regression model, but we're giving it much better features. Um, and then if I calculate those metrics, so again, that MAE, uh, before it was off by about $1,500 per bicycle, we've now dropped that about 66% to, uh, it's only off about $516 per bicycle now. So this model is much, much better. Okay, so key point here, uh, engineered features are the most important thing that you guys should be looking to do when you're developing a data set. Uh, for modeling. Before you do any modeling, try and get the best possible features that you can out of the data that you have available. And um, so feature engineering is super important. We teach it in week three of our uh, 101 course. And um, it's basically just figuring out how to extract you know, features from your, your text data or from dates or from you know whatever data that you're dealing with, trying to get uh, good features out of those. Okay, um, we didn't talk previously about explanation. So now that we've got a decent model, uh, we should talk about what features are driving that model. So how we can get those features, so we've got the model here, which is a, a, just this model O2 underscore LM, and that's this thing here, but um, that's a parsnip model object, and what we can use is this broom tidy, but we have to, um, so Broom is a modeling, is a model helper package. It basically allows us to extract some information a little bit easier. Um, so this, if I look at this model, and if I click on it, it's got this, um, so it opened it up, the model over here, and you can see it's got this fit, um, this, this fit element. So this is actually a list that contains one, two, three, four elements. And that, and that third one is fit. So that's the actual model. I can extract that out with this dollar sign. And now it's no longer a parsnip object. It's just a, um, it's just the, the call to the LM formula function. And then if I pipe it into this function called broom tidy, what it does is it gives me all of the terms and gives me the estimates and the p-values. So if I arrange by p-value, and the lower the p-value, the, the better or the more um, credibility it had, that term has in that model. Uh, so uh, basically the, the most important features are whether it's road or mountain, um, whether the model base was this FSI, and, and the weight. 
the weight um, is is a very important feature, and also this high mod. Um, that's that's a that's a very low p value as well. So anything under about 0.05 is is normally your your threshold for significance. Um, but uh, basically, that's kind of like a rough rule of thumb. Um, the interesting thing that I'll point you to is remember that model that we showed you. So what this is saying is that on average, for every pound that that model increases, meaning uh, that that bicycle, if it goes up by a pound the price goes down by $539. So that's, that's pretty cool. That's an interesting um, uh, way to interpret this model is that we can actually uh, take some of these features and then, you know, in our minds, adjust them <coughs> and understand what, what impact it has on the model. So that's what, when we're talking about explanation, um, and this is very important in business, is being able to explain you know, how, how the, um, the model is performing and, and what's driving that model. So that's, that's the, um, so now that we know a little bit about the linear regression, we can move on to some other algorithms. Um, I'm just gonna run down through these uh, relatively quickly because they aren't uh, huge departures, but the next one is a decision tree. So remember there was those three steps. The first one we had it was a linear regression model. So now we're replacing that with a decision tree. And um, this one has some parameters that we can adjust to it. So if I do question mark decision tree, we'll see that it has three key parameters in here. And what I do is in week six of the 101 course, I spend a lot of time explaining what these parameters mean and some of the theory behind it. Um, but basically, these are going to be parameters that we can tune. So I've picked these by cross-validating. I did that separately. Um, again, it's a little bit of a process uh, in Parsnip. I had to create a bunch of custom functions to do it. But um, cross-validation is normally what you want to do. You never want to cross-validate um, by uh, running it on your, on your test data set because then you're basically picking these values out to, to match your, your, your test data set. So I did these the separately through this process called cross-validation. It's an advanced topic, and we cover cross-validation in 201, uh, in week five of 201 of our, our 201 course. Okay, so when I select these parameters that I've cross-validated, and I run, uh, and I set the engine, and where we find the engine details are down here, so I, I set it to our part, um, and that's one of the available en engines for the decision tree. Um, and then we just do the same fit that we did previously with the linear regression uh, using the engineered features. We can run that and then we can run our model next. And we see our mean absolute error is around uh, $1,343. So it's actually not doing very well. Um, and it's, it's doing slightly better than uh, the linear regression without the engineered features. Uh, the linear regression with the engineered features is blowing it out of the water at $500 uh, absolute error or mean absolute error. Um, and then we can also visualize that error as well. So that's what this is doing. And we can see that there's some pretty large gaps between some of these, these uh, predictions. The hey, nice... Yep. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Jason asks, how do you decide uh, with your client what an acceptable absolute price difference mean is? Example, if average sell is 5K, then a, a APDM of 1%, $50 is okay or should be, I think you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. so, so the, the key thing is that all models are gonna be incorrect. There's just some that are better than others. And what you wanna try and do, um, so I, we haven't talked about classification, but, but those types of models, basically what you wanna do is you wanna convert that into uh, a level of improvement so at every company, even if they're not doing anything prediction wise, they have a, uh, a value of not using the model. So what you wanna show them is how much value or how much improvement that that model gives you in terms of dollars and cents. So for example, if they're using this prediction model to price their own products, the cost of getting that, that price wrong, you wanna, you wanna associate a dollar value and you want to say, okay, this is you know roughly how how much the, um, this model will save your company by doing it this way versus doing it a different way. 
And that, yeah. that's how I would do it. Good question. Um, the, the last piece here, so we saw previously where we did uh, ex the explanation for the linear model uh, using this broom tidy. Uh, we do explanation a little bit differently for the R part model. So we, we again extract out the model, but we just pass it to this R part dot plot. And this is cool because what it does, and this is what I love about decision trees, is it creates a, a tree model for us that we can interpret as a series of binary decisions. So these are what we call decision rules, and that's why it's called a decision tree. So we start out with 50, um, 50 different observations here at the top, and then uh, if it's yes, it goes this way. If it's no, it goes that way. So um, if it's high mod, so high mod is the most important feature, and if it's high mod is zero, it starts, it goes from 4,000 down to $3,294. If high mod is one, meaning high mod is present in the, um, in the model description, it jumps to $8,800. So these are our high end models right here. So anything with high mod in the name starts off as, as an $8,800 model. Um, and then you can, you can kind of go down through. So this DI2 is kind of like a subcategory of high mod. So if, if it's one, it's $9,700. If it's zero, meaning it's not present, it's $7,900. So high mod DI2 model is gonna be your, your most expensive models at $9,700. Um, so, and then you can go down this path and, and see that if the model uh, base is any of these bases, it goes this way. If it's this way, if it's not, it goes this way. And then you can see weight's a, a very important factor next. and uh, the decisions kind of get based on the weight and, and some various other features. So the nice thing about decision trees are they're really interpretable. It's unfortunate though, because this model didn't do very well. Um, so the credibility of this model is only slightly better than um, the, the linear regression uh, without the engineered features. All right, so the last model here that I wanna show you guys is the XG boost model. And this is one that, this is the one that wins all of the Kaggle competitions. It's very good. Um, it's got a bunch of different parameters that you can tune. And again, you have to tune this using, using cross validation. Uh, I did that, I did five fold cross validation and these are the parameters that I got. And um, when I run this, so now that I have the parameters, uh, it's, it, I use this um, function called boost underscore tree from parsnip supply these parameters, set the engine to XG boost, and then do the same fit that we've been doing previously. When I run that, control enter, I get my XG boost model, and I calculate my metrics, and I got about $849. So it does turn out for this data set that linear regression is actually performing the best at $550 uh, MAE. Um, for XG Boost, it's it's still an extra three hundred dollars over that. So it's still not performing badly, but it's um it's definitely not as good as the the linear regression. And you can see like this model here, it didn't do quite as well, which is your high end model. Um, for some of the lower end models, it's doing much better, uh, and so on. Hey Matt, can you go back to the uh, previous um, visualization with the nodes? The, uh, um, there were some questions around uh, what does the 4175 represent on that first node to so the top th number. This is the price. So this is your, your predictor uh, or your outcome, which is $4,175. And then uh, N equals 50, which is your number of observation. And 100% means you start off with 100% of your observations. So then um, right down here, it goes to $8,800. Um, and that's when high mod is not um, is is not less than 0.5. So when high mod equals one, it goes this direction, and then this is eight thousand eight hundred dollars, and n equals eight. So that eight observations went this way, which is sixteen percent of your total observations. Okay, great. And then as you go through the rest of the XG boost, if you can um, maybe talk a little bit about why may outperform some of the other models that we took a look at. So, so XGBoost, and I explained that in detail, um, how XGBoost works in the 101 course. Uh, the reason is, is because of the boosting algorithm. So basically what it's doing is it's combining a lot of 
um, what they call weak learners, which is decision trees, but that aren't nearly as, as either long as this. Um, and, and it ends up just doing slightly better each time. But when you aggregate all of these together, these weak learners become a, a very strong learner. And that's what they call an ensemble. Um, I explain all of that in detail in the 101 course. So definitely take that if you're, if you're really interested in learning all the details about the algorithms uh, and then also how to apply them. Um, but really, uh, it's, there's a lot to the XGBoost algorithm and then there's a lot of parameters to that that you need to learn about. Um, yeah. Okay, and then the last thing I wanna do is you can get feature importance from XGBoost, and that's what I'm doing here. But the downside is, is it's just a percentage gain. It doesn't tell you, it's not like the decision tree where it specifically told you, okay, if it goes this way, it's $8,800, but if it goes this way, it's only $3,000. So this one, it tells you high mod, which it, this might be tough to see, um, but high mod is clearly, for this particular model, the most important feature. If that's in there, um, then that's driving a lot of the predict, prediction accuracy. Uh, and, and this is what's called gain. So it's information gain, meaning um, over 60% of the information, so it's 0 0.6 down here. So over 60% of the information that's being gained from that model is from this high mod feature alone. Then weight is the second most important feature, DI2, Optimo, and so on. So these engineered features are, um, so this is an engineered feature, Weight, weight is a core feature that, that just came right from Cannondale's website. DI2 is an engineered feature. Optimo is an engineered. 101 is an engineered. Category road, that's a core feature. Carbon is an engineered feature. Altegra is an engineered feature, and so on. So you can see out of the first 10 features, about eight of those are, are engineered features. All right. So some conclusions here, um, we saw how to do some modeling. Uh, we saw that the linear regression was actually the most, um, which was the best um, modeling approach. XGBoost was in second. Um, the key point here is that engineered features are a huge boost to this particular model. So including those was a smart choice. Um, some of the features, so the ex explanation, uh, we've got, we see that high mods of a high predictor, weights a high predictor, model base was a high predictor, uh, category road, um, and these all seem to be very important to the global models. Um, but then there's also each, um, we didn't talk about this yet, but there's for every observation, meaning every bike, when we get a new bike, we wanna understand why that one, why the model chooses that bike. And that's what um, this topic called LIME. It stands for Local Interpretable Model Explanation. We teach that in the 201 course, and that's used to explain features locally on a local level, which is very important to the business because generally speaking, they don't care about everything, you know, how the model works, but they want to know specifically why is that one model being selected the way it's being selected. Okay. So that, that, that rounds up the, um, the demo. Hopefully you guys liked it. Hopefully you learned a lot. Um, is there any questions right now that I should answer? Um, yeah, we got a bunch. Um, let me, let me see if I can pick some of the ones that I think be the most impactful. And there's some of, a lot of people have overlapping. So, you know, I think if you could explain, um, feature engineering a little bit, like why you would do it, how it works. And feature engineering is really a big topic. I started typing the answer and then I was like, it's, it's getting too long. <laughs> so maybe just like a, you know, a quick, quick summary of what it means. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll actually point you guys to a reference. Um, and we actually sent this on the last edition of the um, uh, Data Science Fundamentals newsletter. But Max Kuhn has uh, a feature engineering book. So Max Coons is also creating the Parsnet package. And if you go to this feature engineering, www.feet.engineering, click that. That's a free book. And this goes into a lot of information on feature engineering. Uh, it is more of an intermediate to advanced book. So if you don't really have the, the basics with data manipulation, visualization, um, and modeling, it might be a little advanced for you, but it's a really, really good resource for what feature engineering is and how you can do it. Um, I will sum it up in, in terms of this particular example. 
So what I did um, for the example was I took a look at this price versus weight. So this is what I got off of Cannondale's website. Um, and this, and I saw that this, this model description has a lot of um, similar features that keep popping up. Like these first three models are high mod. So what I did was I ended up splitting this model up into different elements. And then I ended up um, count, counting how many times those elements appeared. And the ones that, any, anything that appeared more than four times, uh, I chose to turn that into an engineered feature. Meaning if high, high mod appears in the description, I just make a flag one or zero. Um, if, if disc appears, I make a flag of one or zero. If Dura Ace uh, appears, and then we saw this DI2, so that, that DI2 appeared here, um, and that ended up being a very important feature. So that's how I did it, and I teach that process in the uh, 101 course. Yeah. Um, and then is the featured engineering, is that something that you did, um, is it already done in the CSV for them? Yeah, I already did it in the CSV. So you guys can pull up that CSV file, and you can actually see what those features look like. So we've got a model base, uh, which is just a kind of a categorical feature. And then we've got a bunch of ones and uh, binary features, ones and zeros. And you can see what, what features I created. All right, awesome. Yep. Okay, let me, um, let me step back just for a couple more. There were some questions back to the uh, Parsnip. Um, Andrew was wondering, um, what are, oh, this is a slightly different. It froze up, David. All right, I'm gonna continue on just real quick. Um, I do have some learning recommendations if you guys wanna get started. So um, here are three things that if you want to learn how to do machine learning, this is what I recommend that you learn. Uh, there's some key algorithms that you should learn. Uh, there's also figuring out how to apply the algorithms to the business. And then the third piece is distributing results. So in order to do these three things, um, you can kind of step through it this way. So the, the six key algorithms that you need to learn, I, I put them right here. There's linear regression, regularized regression, decision trees, random forest, gradient boost machines, and support vector machines. Um, those are the six algorithms that you need to know to be effective as a, as a data scientist. Uh, those are the minimum. There's also deep learning, but that's a more of an advanced one. Uh, I would say at a minimum, you need to know these six. Uh, the good thing is, is we teach all of those uh, with five hours of content just in week six of our um, business analysis with our course, our 101 course. So we've got five hours of lessons just on these. Um, the other thing too, though, to keep in mind is you can't really jump, just jump right into machine learning. You, you kind of yeah. need to learn data manipulation. You need to learn some other stuff. So that's why I want to go over this, um, this uh, little uh, diagram for you. So we teach machine learning in week six. So we have eight hours of videos, three hours on clustering, five hours on regression, and two challenges in our 101 course. Uh, but really, um, you also need to learn the fundamentals. That's what we do in weeks one through five. So we have about 25 hours of video lessons on data manipulation, time series, text, categorical, visualization, programming and iteration. And then we have several challenges within those first five weeks. And then we also uh, cap it off with business reporting uh, with our markdown and you have two projects. So it ends up being a really good course for people who want to learn machine learning, uh, the basics uh, and the foundations, but also need that need the basics as well in terms of working with data. Um, the next thing that you need to do is you need to learn binary classification. So that's a little bit more complicated of a problem because uh, you have to deal with things like AUC, ROC, uh, like all the different jargon that goes along with it. Um, and it's more of an advanced way to think about the problem in terms of confusion matrix, uh, yes, no, uh, true positives, fa uh, false positives, false negatives true negatives, and so on. So it becomes a, a little bit more of a challenging problem, but it's the problems that affect businesses the most. So um, learning binary classification, we actually teach that in our 201 course, um, and, this, and we actually uh, do a churn problem. So it's very relatable to customer churn or for employee attrition, which is actually the problem that we teach. Um, it's very relatable to that problem. 
and basically any binary classification problem it's relatable to. Um, we teach AutoML, which is what we talked about last week. Uh, week five, we do modeling. Week six, we do performance. So all of the, the different performance metrics. So you're seeing on your screen here, H2O, the um, precision and recall, the ROC uh, plots. And that's kind of how you um, evaluate your different modeling algorithms and how well they're performing for uh, a classification problem. Uh, we also teach Lime, which is what we talked about towards the end of the presentation today, which is how you explain local um, feature importance for a specific observation, meaning why did that customer leave the company, or why is that bike model being predicted to be you know, $8,000. Um, this is how you tell your business leaders that particular information on a local level. Um, Decision trees and linear regression, that's good for a global, you know, saying on average, this is, this is why the model chooses what it chooses, but locally, you want to go with something like Lime, and, and this is a great plot, a tornado plot that you can put in, in front of your vision, in, fr in, in front of your um, business leaders, and they can make decisions, and they can see which features are, are the most important. Uh, and then the last piece is you want to be able to distribute results. So what ends up happening is you, um, in order to be able to affect decision making in an organization, typically you want to be able to put the, um, the, the algorithm in front of the decision makers, which are, which are usually business people um, that are you know, working with customers every day or working with you know, people every day. So you do that through a web app. And um, there's a lot of things you need to learn with that. There's interactive visualizations, there's building dashboards, uh, and then there's also integrating the machine learning into those. So that's what we do in um, the third course, which we're getting ready to release uh, next month. It's the Shiny Web App for Business, and it basically takes your H2O model, your Lime charts, and your, um, uh, your, your foundational dplyr, uh, you have to use that in order to be able to put together all of the different information that you want to put in front of your business leaders. So for example, this is a web app. It has H2O built in. It assesses the employee prediction risk and it shows which features are contributing to the, um, to, to the particular uh, employee leaving and it has them listed over here and um, it makes a really good uh, way for, for business people um, to be able to change their decision making based on data. So um, this is the business science learning uh, system. Uh, we've got those three courses I just talked about and each one of them kind of takes care of different sets of skills. So you've got your foundations plus machine learning, then you've got your uh, advanced machine learning and business consulting, and then you've got your web application uh, development with the third course. So the result. Yeah. I think uh, so. I know we talked about if you're brand new to all of this, it may feel a little bit overwhelming. Um, a lot of terminology and um, a lot of different types of technology, but the courses are designed in such a way to walk you through everything. It, um, Matt explains it, he walks you through the code, you code along with it at your own pace, and, um, and it kind of all becomes much more clear. So um, hopefully, you know, you weren't intimidated by it all, but it, it really is a good system and a system that's designed to get you, um, you know, up and running with data science so that you can uh, be proficient in it. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, I think um, really the bottom, what ends up happening with the courses is they're a lot slower pace. I mean, you can obviously speed up the videos if you want to go faster pace, but um, you know, there's only so much I can do in a, or we can do in a, in a 30 minute time slot, um, once every couple of weeks. So what the courses do is they give you, you know, with about five to 10 hours a week of work on your end, um, in seven to 10 weeks, you're completing each one of these courses and it's building an additional skill set. And once you get through three of those courses, you basically have the majority of the skills that you need as a data scientist to be able to have the foundations taken care of, the advanced machine learning, the, the tying it to the business with business consulting, uh, and then also building the web applications. Mm -hmm. Yep.
So yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot like climbing a hill. Um, it's, it's intimidating at first, but once you um, take the system and, and uh, learn each of the skill sets, you know, you eventually get to the top and you'll be shocked at in what little time you're able to accomplish uh, a lot and, and really build your knowledge up to, to be very advanced very quickly. Yeah. And um, to John, no, you don't need high level math before the course. As a matter of fact, you don't need a whole lot. You just need to um, have patience, um, have an open mind and just kind of have fun with it and, you know, go at your own pace. Yeah, I, I would say the prerequisites for 101 is, is pretty much minimal. Um, you don't need any math. Uh, really, that one's teaching a lot of the foundational skills and just kind of it, 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 over, over the course of seven weeks, it builds up. And by the end of it, you're learning machine learning. A lot, <clears throat> a lot of the stuff that we went over on this, it's, it's going to be very simple to you by the end of it. Yep. And then the 201 is the next level, which is, is, is more advanced. But, you know, as you make your way through, you'll get there. So we do have a promotional code for you. It's called Learning Labs. So labs is plural. Um, and that'll get you 15% off on all of the different courses. And um, it'll, it's, it's a, you know, we want you to start off your journey with 15% off. So th this is uh, this kind of the summary, the bonus. Uh, you get 15% off. Uh, again, these are amazing courses. I wish I had them back when I was starting. And, um, and, and, and David, he even, uh, he, he took both the, the 101 and the 201 and he had a lot, a lot of fun with them. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It's really good. Like I'm, I'm, I've taken a lot of online courses and I'm sitting here with Matt now and I'm helping him with the presentation and having a lot of fun with it. And so you may think that I'm up here as like the salesperson, but truly like I took um, the business science course and I felt like it was the, the only online course I took that sort of put everything together. I'm taking other courses where, um, you learn a lot about the tactics, but it's not done in, in a workflow manner that you can actually use as a reusable template for different projects. So that's the thing that I like the most. Um, one of the things I like the most about um, the courses is because you can actually walk through it and you leave away with a, a structure that, that's reproducible for, um, for other data challenges. Uh, so yeah, definitely check it out. I would say it's well worth the money. All right, so um, I want to thank everyone. And now, if we have a few minutes for questions, I know we're going a little bit late on time, but um, yeah, want to help, um, help those that stuck around out. There's some questions around um, the course being so. So yes, the course is self-paced. You can do it at your own time. If you know, it's not like if you miss a week, um, it moves on to the next week, and you can't go back. It's truly at your own pace. You can access it forever. Um, There's a Slack channel too for questions. Yeah. Like when you have, um, you know, any, any sort of question, it doesn't even have to be related to the course. Um, you know, just post it up in the, in the Slack channel. Uh, and we have a community of people. I think we have like almost 300 and just in the Slack channel now, which is about 50% of our students are in there. So we have about 600 students uh, over, around half of them are, are in the Slack channel, like-minded people yeah. helping, helping each other out. And I'm in there too. And so is, um, Aaron Liddell of H2O who was on last week. She's in there. Um, and we're just yeah. helping people out. So yeah, Robert had just asked about that. How do you get questions answered in, in the module, in the particular learning module you're on, there's a, a question section down there. You can post a question directly to the module uh, and it'll be answered or you can go to the Slack channel. The Slack channel is always great because it's more real time. So we would yeah. suggest yep. you, you go there. Yeah, sl Slack, I'm definitely faster on Slack just because I'm in there every day. Um, the forums, usually a one to two day response time is, is about the norm. Um, and you know, it, it'll, it'll vary, especially if it's like on a weekend, if I'm traveling or something like that. But Slack, I have it on my phone. Um, that's, that's probably the easiest way to get in touch with me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that might be about it uh, for the questions. Okay. We really appreciate everybody for sticking around uh, 
you know, for the whole webinar. This was, this was exciting. Yeah, this was great. Thank you guys so much. Um, it's really fun to interact and I love doing these. Uh, and I, and David, you've been doing an awesome job too. I love, um, you know, you're, oh, appreciate you're, it, man. You're this is fun well. stuff. Yeah, yeah. This, this is great. Thanks. So for you guys, everybody, it's going to be, uh, the webinar will be recorded. It'll be sent out in the email along with the, um, the slide deck. You can go to Business Science's uh, website. Um, I'll actually put a link up here real quick. Yeah. But there's a lab section where you can access the previous episodes. Yeah. Um, we've, we've been emailing them out on Friday. So if you don't get your, um, if you don't get it via email on Friday, um, shoot me an email and let me know. Uh, we have had some issues with um, people having um, our emails go to spam. So that oh, might yeah. be, good that point. Might be uh, an, an issue if, um, if you aren't getting emails from us. Yeah, good point. So yeah, we'll uh, send the, the assets out. You guys can enjoy the code, play around with it, learn something, and we'll see you on the next one. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Take care, everybody. All right. See ya.